Now, I want to walk you through certain more interesting implications of this discussion, just in case you missed it. So, here's how our life goes. Things happen in our childhood which leave us with a deep sense of inadequacy. So, if I were to draw this again, and I'm going to uh, do a little bit of a drawing, I'll leave the circle to stay. Let's say this is my being, okay? This is my entire being. There are places within me that are still hurting, consisting of experiences of shame, disappointment, and failure. But rather than face them, what do I do? I go grab a shopping cart and go shopping. What is the kind of shopping I'm talking about? Not in the Beechwood Mall or the Strongsville Mall. I'm talking about shopping in the Mall of Life, where I go shopping for accolades, certifications, credentials, and trophies. I acquire four master's degrees and a PhD. Somebody else acquires five mansions. Somebody else acquires private jets, bank accounts. You build a resume. You are filling up your shopping cart with an extensive array of accolades and symbolic achievements. But folks, is the shopping cart being filled up outside you or inside you? Outside you. And is the emptiness and lack of self-worth inside you or outside you? Inside you. And that's why these two never meet. And that's why you end up with the very interesting paradox. Certain highly accomplished people in life can be extremely feeling inadequacy. And in fact, it's their feelings of inadequacy that may be propelling them towards extraordinary amounts of achievement without recognizing that no amount of insecurity or inadequacy born out of an early childhood contingency can ever be medicated with external evidence. Folks, how many of you know that there are actors and actresses in Hollywood that you think of as very beautiful, but they tell you that they think of themselves as ugly? Because where the insecurity or inadequacy was created out of the seeds of childhood anguish, it does not matter how much compensatory evidence the environment gives you. After earning what would be the equivalent of four master's degrees and a PhD, after writing 35 peer-reviewed papers and a book, I still feel intellectually inadequate. I'm an insecure person because that insecurity never goes away. If there's one thing I want you to take away from the seminar, it is the importance of examining and turning inward and exploring these feelings of self-hate and inadequacy that exist within you because they become a black hole which keeps sucking in achievement after achievement but don't yield a corresponding incremental difference in any form of fulfillment. Understand this, if you can love and accept yourself for who you are, that's the biggest thing that you can do for yourself. It's the mark of a phenomenal revolution. If you can understand the forms of inadequacy that have plagued you and the compensatory behaviors that you've engaged in. Now, I want to say something that will run so contrary to how you've been socialized in modern societies. And so you'll probably get pissed off at me or you'll look at me with such incredulousness in your eyes. I'm going to propose to you that the desire for success and ambition, the flames of which are constantly stoked by society, is actually mental illness. Why would I say that? Think about this. If you have the biggest inferiority complex in the country, you have to become the prime minister or the president. Nothing short of that will help you resolve your feeling of inadequacy. If you have a still smaller inferiority complex, you get your rise from doing weekend seminars and that's enough. So are we dealing with a hierarchy of inferiority complexes and our compensatory mechanisms are actually cover-ups? Think about this. Why would you be ambitious? Why would the desire for success arise unless you experience yourself as a failure? You start with feelings of failure and then you compensate for it, then you strive for success. Now remember, I'm not saying success is a sign of illness. I'm saying ambition and the desire for success is because sometimes success comes from just being yourself. You are a poet, you write poetry, the world appreciates it, you become a successful poet. It's a natural expression of who you are or an artist or a musician, which is very different from the strategic calculations by which we say, I'm going to kick everybody else on their ass and I'm going to tower about everybody else. And with that competitive mindset, we pile up achievements as a way of establishing our sense of self-worth. So is it possible? Because think about it, folks. Now, I want you to turn metaphorical on me. How many of you would agree that four master's degrees and a PhD and 35 um, scholarly papers, peer-reviewed papers, is a fairly high level of academic accomplishment? So let's talk metaphors now. Do you see that cars, for example, are 
pers are arranged in different levels of prestige, right? Like for example, there's a song my son was listening to and I heard of this wholly new car that I'd never heard about that you wake up in. I woke up in a new Bugatti. <laughs> How many of you heard the song? Well, very, very culturally literate audience here. And for those of you who have not heard the song, you're a bunch of losers. <laughs> okay, so I woke up in a new Bugatti. Or, you know, so if you were to equate my level of academic achievement metaphorically to a prestige of a car, what car would you choose? Come on, shout it out. Which one? Bugatti. Bugatti. Let's take the Bugatti, okay? <laughs> now, folks, walk with me. If I'm driving a Bugatti, what would be most people's reactions? You know, most people have been conditioned by the norms of society to really look up to wealth, power, and prestige. We say, wow, Param seems to have made it. Through his wildlife sucks seminar, he bought himself a Bugatti. <laughs> it's more likely that I'll declare bankruptcy for my wildlife sucks <laughs> seminar, given the enormous amounts of money you've paid for this experience. <laughs> right? So, you know, I want to be just like him. We look up to people who are wealthy, powerful, and prestigious. But how many of you would agree that the metaphorical Bugatti that I'm driving, which is all this academic accomplishment, is because somebody called me mentally retarded? So if you see me driving a Bugatti, you need to walk up with me and walk up to me and instead of congratulating me, you need to give me a hug and say, Param, I'm so sorry you have to buy a, drive a Bugatti. You must feel like a piece of shit inside. <laughs> you must feel pretty shitty inside. In other words, if you find a child trying to be successful, maybe you should say, you know what? I can find you a good therapist. You must have a deep sense of inadequacy inside. Now, I know many of you are puzzled because you don't know what to do with this. Now, I threw you a curveball. Because how many of you have been striving for success? Oh my God, you're all en masse fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> this is group therapy. That's why we invited you here. <laughs> no, just kidding. So, the distinction for the Eastern mystic like Osho is between ambition versus flowering. Ambition is where you say, I want to acquire four master's degrees and a PhD so I can feel superior to others. Flowering is where you engage in something because you're intrinsically interested in it and that engagement enables you to flower. Some of us will flower as dancers. Some of us will flower as people who play the drums on their stomach. Some of us will flower as people who cross-dress and sing Barbara Streisand songs. Flowering can let a thousand flowers bloom and we will all flower. But we have created a, a prison in which people are sentenced to educational specializations and professions in which they just don't fit. Somebody who's meant to be a dancer is maintaining accounts for Enron. 